Hi everyone, welcome to Five Coach Shakespeare, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Themes, Symbols and Archetypes. In this series, we do a close reading thematic analysis of all 17 chapters, and today we're going to look at chapter 6, the journey from platform 9 and 3 quarters. Three new important themes are introduced in this chapter. We see power corrupts the problem with Percy. We get a look at the, the Weasleyan hero, how Ron overcomes his resentment and envy of Harry and others. We also see the Grangerian hero introduced, how Hermione overcomes her Malfoy-like arrogance. The chapter begins with a restatement of and further development of three important themes, magic as artistic vision, fear of the unknown, and Nietzsche's resentiment. And the chapter closes with a restatement and further development of three more important themes, avoidance coping, classicism, snobbery, bigotry, the death of childhood, and the thr threshold crossing. What I do in each video is first identify important characteristics of each theme, and then we dig deeply into the text and pull out several quotes that prove the claim. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and you can instantly download a copy of the PDFs I use in this series by visiting my shop and making a one-time purchase. See the description for details. Chapter 6 is a very important threshold chapter. We've had a few micro thresholds where Harry's moving closer and closer to the Dark Forest, and he's not quite in the Dark Forest yet, but he kind of is because where he is already is kind of unknown. He's leaving the Dursleys behind, but Chapter 6 quite literally introduces a threshold. He has to leave the platform and enter a train, which is a threshold, and the train, Hogwarts Express, is, is, the, is the unknown, taking him to an even greater unknown, which is, of course, Hogwarts. So chapter six opens with a reminder of the world he's leaving behind, of the narrow, restricted world uh, Harry is leaving behind. To the unreceptive muggles, the Dursley family, the, the, the chapter opens with the Dursleys. A train station is just, is just a train station. To an adult going to work, commuting every day, we see the world, we don't see the world. We pass through a world we don't see anymore because we don't have the, 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 the young, naive vision of a child, the good, naive vision of a child. So a train station is just a train station to the muggles, to the Dursleys. They cannot and will not see platform nine and three quarters. Nine and three quarters is a beautiful metaphor for what the artist sees that we don't. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what I'm going to argue in uh, in this section. So the muggles, so the non-creative people, uh, they prefer the trite, the familiar, the safe, known world. I'm taking my commute. There's the place where I buy a coffee. There's the train. There's my seat. There's the buildings passing by that I don't even see anymore because they are they have become familiar and trite. But the wizarding folk, the receptive, so as a metaphor for those who are receptive, they have receptive gifts. They're possessed of gifts of creative curiosity, and they are rewarded with transcendent experience. This is what it was like to see the world when you were a child. And this is why adults love Harry Potter, because we revisioned the world. The artist helps us recover the wonder, the awe, and the reverence that was the world when we were children and seeing everything for the first time. So it, it is, it, it's, it's, it's quite beautiful. So adult readers of Harry Potter recover the familiar. We start to see anew what we've seen a thousand times. Uh, and I've got a really nice statement here about uh, from, from Tolkien actually in his essay on fairy stories. He, he, he describes this perfectly. James Joyce talked about this as well uh, in his, his, his essays on aesthetic arrest, why why uh, we are attracted to art, and Van Gogh certainly recaptures for us something that we see all the time and that has become mundane and the artist elevates it above the mundane into something transcendent. So here's a, here's a quote from the beginning of Harry Potter, page uh, of chapter six. So Harry ran, so he's running towards the, the, the wall that only the muggles see a wall, but those with artistic curiosity see something else. So Harry ran and closed his eyes ready for a crash and the Dursleys would crash. A person too dull-minded, dull-spirited to see the world with, 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 a, with that sense of wonder would crash. But it doesn't crash for Harry because he's not that kind of person. It, it, the crash didn't come. He kept on running. He opened his eyes, ladies and gentlemen. The artist, J.K. Rowling, helps us open our eyes to the wonderment of the world. A scarlet steam engine was waiting next to a platform packed with people. A sign overhead said Hogwarts Express, 11 o'clock, and there's the reward. If you do have the courage and the curiosity, maybe curiosity is more important. If you do have that sense of wonder, you can recapture that sense of wonder in the boring things that you see every day, like the stupid commuter train that you're, that you're on every morning going to school or going to work. So here's, here's, here's a beautiful, beautiful excerpt that I've adapted from uh, Tolkien uh, in his great essay on fairy stories. The purpose of fairy stories, the purpose of fantasy is this. Look what Van Gogh does for us. The people in these cities, the people in your city, you walk by this all the time and you don't even see it. 
And once in a while, if you are so inclined, you pause and you look and you start to see things glow. You start to see a shimmer. You start to, to see a, a transcendence in the mere existence of things. And that's what the artists do for us. Musicians as well, the same kind of thing. So recovery. So Tolkien he talks about recovery, which includes return and renewal of health. We return to the childlike sense of wonder. It's the renewal, the return to that naive, not in a negative sense, the positive sense of the word naive, to see the world anew. So recovery, which includes return and renewal of health, is a regaining of a clear view, not seeing things as they are, but seeing things as we are meant to see them, as something fresh, as things apart from ourselves. We haven't, so he's gonna talk here about how like I said, you're commuting to work, you're commuting to school every day, and you don't see anything because they've become part of you. Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. You've internalized all that stuff, and it's not something out there and wondrous and strange. S things seen clearly must be freed from the drab blur of triteness or familiarity, from possessiveness. We possess them. We become part of them, and they become part of us in not a good way. Of all faces, those of our familiars are the ones most difficult to see with fresh attention. Look at the people around you. Don't take your brother and sister for granted. Don't take your mom and dad for granted. Step back, away, get some distance, make them an object and look at them as something, a, 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 a strange and wonderful creature out there in the universe as opposed to just part of your breakfast cereal and coffee. So triteness is really the penalty of appropriation. We appropriate things, we, we bring them too close to us. We become too integrated and therefore we can't see them properly. So triteness is really the penalty of appropriation of things which once attracted us by their glitter, look at that, or their color or their shape. Glitter, color, and shape. This is how a young person sees a train. Wow, there's a train. The first time you went to a big city, do you remember that? Wow, a big city. That's the newness, that's the freshness. And we laid hands on them, and we laid, we, and we laid hands on them, and then locked them in our hoard, acquired them, and acquiring, we ceased to look at them. So when we first saw them, we saw all this wonderful stuff, and then they became ours, and we locked them in this cage after we've acquired them, and we don't look at them anymore. So the artist's job, here's Van Gogh's cafe, terrace at night, he helps us recover that sense of wonder, awe, and reverence. It really is a, a reverence for existence. That's the job of the artist, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, again, as I said, so the chapter opens with uh, uh, the, the fear of the unknown and the resentiment of the muggles who can't see that. We're not all of us Van Gogh. We're not all these artistic geniuses, but we can participate in the wonderment and reverence of existence through the eyes of the artist. J.K. Rowling gave us platform nine and three quarters. Wonderful. That's a lens through which we can re-encounter re the wonder of existence. Thank you very much. So Vernon has acquired the things of the world. He's acquired them. He works at Grunnings, drills. He doesn't even see the drills. It's just everyday, boring, mundane work. He has acquired them and he has ceased to look at them. Worse, now even worse than just being dull-minded, worse than simply being dull-minded and dull-spirited and uncurious, worse than that is Nietzsche's resentiment. Okay, He wants everyone to not see it. He resents anyone who can see what he can't and or maybe even won't, won't see. So Uncle Vernon stopped dead. Look at that language. Look at that language. Stop dead versus he ran, he ran, he ran, he ran. He kept on running. He opened his eyes. Open. Look at the look at the look at the, the dynamics here. There's a dynamism in the person who's willing to see, and there's a stasis, there's a paralysis in the people who are not willing to see. So Uncle Vernon stopped dead, facing the platforms with a nasty grin on his face. There's the Nietzsche's resentiment. Well, there you are, boy. Platform nine, platform ten. Your platform should be somewhere in the middle, but they don't seem to have built it yet, do they? Do you see the spite? There's a gleeful spite of the, of the dull spirit, and so don't let them bring you down. So Nietzsche's, uh, I've, this is from my, my, first, uh, my, my first video. Uh, it's just a very, uh, I'll briefly uh, recap this. Nietzsche's resentiment, a vengeful, petty-minded state of being that does not so much want what others have, it's not that kind of greedy envy, although that's part of it, as they want others not to have what they have. He wants to destroy this. If you're with people in your life who bring you down every time you're excited about something, get rid of those people because they're filled with Nietzsche's resentiment. You got something that they don't want you to have. Resentiment is more fully defined as the desire to live a pious existence and thereby position oneself to judge others, apportion blame, and determine responsibility. You're a freak. You're a weirdo. You're seeing stuff that doesn't exist. You don't live in the real world. Uh, um, and I sit in judgment of you. 
Okay, so uh, another important theme that's uh, introduced here is the problem with Percy. Power corrupts. Percy Weasley is very much in the background of the story. He's not one of the dominant Weasleys. He's not, he's not there making us laugh and, and, and we're not observing him on his adventure, but he's a very important character because he introduces Rowling's concern with the seductive nature of power, the seductive power of power for power's sake. Uh, he starts off as a decent guy from a decent family, but he gets sucked into that vortex. Uh, and it is a real danger in the real world. So per uh, Percy is an allegorical figure of the every man or the every person, the smart every person who does uh, uh, make terrible, terrible mistakes that lead to terrible, terrible social consequences. So in chapter six, Percy Weasley is introduced as a smart, ambitious, politically minded youth leader, seemingly destined for a great career. Yeah. And someone that we love and trust loves and trusts him. And that's how dangerous it can be. Over the course of the series, Percy evolves into a tragic Orwellian figure who becomes trapped in a system whose singular lust for power, for power's sake, he didn't foresee. And we can't. He believes in the system. He trusts the system. It seems to be working well. It's keeping order and peace and good governance, perhaps. You can't see it until it's too late very, very often. And he doesn't understand it until it's too late. It's no accident. This is, this is how clever Rowling is. All these little tiny clues and motifs are built up. A web, a tapestry of motifs are built up. And by the end of the whole seven books, all of it seems to make sense. That's really, really good and difficult storytelling. So it's no accident that Percy is associated with the Scabbers' Pettigrew affair. He is the one who inserted that corruption of, of Peter Pettigrew. And with tragic results, you'd see fatal results. Uh, so so, so here, here's the quote. The oldest boy came striding into sight. Striding, look at that language. Yes, nice and proud and proper. Uh, he had already changed into his billowing black uh, Hogwarts robes and Harry noticed a shining gold and red and gold badge on his chest with the letter P in it. Aren't I a good boy? Aren't I a good girl? Can't stay long, mother, he said. I'm up front with the prefects and I, we've got two compartments to ourselves. Privileges. How come Percy gets the new robes anyway, said one of the twins. Because he's a prefect, said his mother fondly. Yes, everybody's proud of that. And, and rightly so. If you can keep on track and you can recognize what's going well and what's not going well, then yeah, you should be proud of it. So the, the, seductive, the seductions of officialdom are power, status, and perks. And Percy gets sucked into that. So he seems normal enough. Future monster? Maybe. Future this guy? Maybe. Uh, if you don't know about uh, 1984 by George Orwell, read it, read it, read it, or uh, watch the movie even. Uh, if, first, maybe, because it's a very difficult novel and the, the, the movie does a fantastic job of capturing uh, uh, the key themes and the tone of the novel, which is very, very, very dark. So Rowling, certainly a student of the political novel, certainly, 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 Rowling had that on her shelf when she was writing Harry Potter, the, especially book five and, and the last books, I am sure. So Rowling, especially in book five, shares many of Orwell's concerns regarding the preciousness and fragility of de democratic rights and freedoms. How tyranny can prevail, not by explosive revolution, but seductively, stealthily, by slow measures, all of our rights and freedoms can be eroded away. And then all of a sudden, like Percy, you wake up and say, wow, what happened? Wow, read some of your history of the 20th century. This, this is what it is. And, and, and Orwell knew it, and Ro uh, Rowling felt it as well. So what are you seeking? Are these people who seek power, are they seeking uh, power so that they can use that power to better society? Very, 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 very often, no. So the party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We know that no one ever seizes power with intention of giving it up. Power is not a means to an end to help society, to help people, like the leaders very often promise, power is an end in itself. It's what we, lo it's what we aim for. And this is a quote by, um, uh, by, by, by one of the, uh, the ministry officials, O'Brien. He's, he's really, really sinister. He, he's a Percy Weasley type. If Percy had let himself go completely and joined the dark side completely and, uh, before pulling back. Uh, here's my, one of my favorite quotes in that novel, 1984, and it is very closely uh, connected to, to Rowling's uh, grasp of the idea. So Winston grasps some, so Winston is the protagonist. He's the hero. And by the way, 1984, this whole hero's quest cycle that I describe in this book, 1984 is exactly that, except at the end, Winston is a failed hero instead of uh, victorious. Sorry, spoiler. 
So Winston, the protagonist, grasps some terrible idea. So he recognizes something. He's, he's awakened to something, a terrible thing, something that was beyond forgiveness and could never be remedied, had just happened. Someone, so he's in a bar. He's in a bar or a restaurant listening to conversations around him. Someone whom the old man who was listening to talking had, uh, had loved had been killed. Every few minutes, the old man kept repeating. Now here's, this is the disillusionment of the working class, of the average person, of the every man, of the every person. It's the disillusionment. You vote for someone, you think it's going well. You vote for some measures because it's, you know, it's a, you, you vote for some measures that limit freedoms because it seems like a good idea at the time. <laughs> That's what it is. All of Percy's decisions were made under that premise. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And you don't want to have to look back at your past decisions with that in mind. And so this poor man here, he's, he's probably drunk and he's, he's, he's crying into his beer to, to his people around him. We didn't ought to have trusted him. I said so, Ma, didn't I? That's what comes of trusting him. We shouldn't have trusted the politicians. We shouldn't have given up a little bit of our freedoms. Okay, we'll give it up. We'll give this up now because it seems like a good idea. We'll give this up now because it seems like it's useful. We'll give this up now because it seems like it's useful. I said it all along. We didn't ought to have trusted the buggers. Constant vigilance is what Rowling is saying. We need constant vigil vigilance. Percy trusted the system perhaps with noble intentions at the beginning, uh, but he was smart enough and noble enough to, uh, to, to pull back from the brink. So do watch the movie if you haven't read the novel and then go watch, read the novel. It's really, really important. Uh, on a more optimistic note, the Weasley and Hero, uh, the Cain and Abel story, how Ron overcomes his raisonnement. You are very aware of the Cain and Abel story, even if you're not aware of it. Uh, the, the, the brother murder theme, I talk about that in my Shakespeare videos a lot, but from popular culture, it's all over the place. You've got two brothers, one is superior to the other. What do you do with that? What does the less superior brother do with that? Uh, the Cain and Abel story comes from the Bible, and it's the, the brother, the brother Cain, they both make an offering to God. God favors Abel, the brother Abel's uh, uh, offerings more than Cain's, and Cain gets jealous and angry and resentful, and he murders his brother. So brother murder is an old, uh, an old, 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 old theme because it's part of family dynamics, and family dynamics are archetypal dynamics. So great stories, myth, religion, fairy tales, pop culture address our central psychological concerns, the archetypal concerns, which will never go away because they're hardwired into our DNA. Our very biological structure is the hero's quest story, is the sibling or the child-parent relationship stories. These are all archetypal uh, situations. So none is more central than our relationship with our family. Sibling, sibling rivalry, as you might be aware, can be vicious. So brother murder or brother figure, remember uh, Joker and Batman are brother figures, they're brother uh, uh, um, archetypal situations, uh, Ron and Harry, Ron and Hermione, those are the sibling uh, uh, figures. Uh, brother murder has two fundamental causes. It's hurt. It's very, very, it's very much hurt. Dad loves you more. Mom loves you more. People love you more. Why do mom and dad and people generally love you more? Why are you favored? What made you the chosen one, Harry? Do you see? So hurt is very, very understandable, and we have sympathy for the hurt. The envy starts to cross the line into something that gets more sinister, and as we see, as we see in our stories and real life, it can become it become fatal uh, or or symbolically fatal. You can murder a relationship. You can re murder murder love within a family, or within friendships. So envy. He's smarter. He's taller. He's better looking. She's stronger. She's she's smarter. Uh, yeah, and fair enough. Some people are born um, with all of those advantages. And so what do you do if you don't have those advantages? It can result in shame, bitterness, resentment, anger, a sense of injustice, personal injustice, and this cosmic injustice. Why is the universe structured so? And that can lead, of course, devastatingly to a desire for revenge and destruction. In fact, you could argue probably that the majority of the world's misery coming from violence, people on people, nations on nations, comes from this desire for revenge at the cosmic injustice of things. Look around, look at history and look at personal relationships, look at the news. It's very, very sad. It's very hard to, it's hard to be the runt. Now, Ron is good natured here in this picture. We see the, the, a good natured, yeah. Here's a good old Ron, I'm good old Ron. Yeah, kind of a goof compared to Harry and Hermione, kind of a goof compared to my, my Percy. All of these, you know, the, the, my older brothers who are taller, better looking, more charismatic, more popular, funnier, braver, more confident, more extroverted than I am. Ha 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 ha, isn't that funny? It must be tough though. The runt is a, being a runt is a cosmic injustice. It's not fair. It's a tough role to play. Ron struggles vis-a-vis -vis Harry and Hermione as well. Now you've seen the Joker vis-a-vis -vis the Batman. You've seen, uh, look at the arms, the arms, uh, the, this, 
this Kenneth Branagh was the director of this, the guy who plays Gilderoy Lockhart. He's a Shakespearean director and actor. Uh, and he, look at this, he picked Thor to do as a movie, I think, way, way back uh, because of the Shakespearean brother murder Cain and Abel theme. It's brilliant. Look at the arms on this. This is the chosen one. This is the guy who's not chosen, the runt. How do you gonna, how are you, what are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna do with that? Loki and the Joker vow personal and cosmic revenge against their Batman and Thor and against existence itself. I'm gonna burn it all down. So does Ron burn it all down? No, he doesn't. And that's why I call him the Weasleyan hero. He overcomes the, 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 the injustice that has been laid upon him. And chapter six introduces it very, very subtly. Again, 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 the way Rowling interweaves all these motifs like a tapestry. It begins here in chapter six. So chapter six introduces the Cain and Abel problem, very much a problem, which is f developed fully in two books, Harry Potter four and again in Harry Potter seven, when Ron succumbs to self-pity, but eventually heroically rejects it. Yeah, you, you, you're familiar with this, even if you haven't read the books yet, which you have. You remember from the movie, Ron gets all sullen and resentful and bitter and filled with self-pity and he's, he's heading down a dark path. He's heading down a dark path, uh, but he turns it around and that's why I call him the Weasley and hero because he does what we should be doing with those kinds of feelings. Malfoy doesn't. The Malfoy as Cain. Malfoy is a character foil for Harry and for everybody else and Malfoy does what, and for Ron, Malfoy does what Ron doesn't do, do you see? Uh, so the Malfoy as Cain theme runs throughout the entire series. The entire series is Malfoy failing to oh, to become the Weasley and hero, hero until the very, 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 very end when he, yes, he's a beautiful character too, but we'll get to that when we get to the last book. Uh, so here's the introduction to, uh, of it. The very, very first time we see this, Harry, uh, Ron is talking to Harry and Harry said, I wish I had three wizarding brothers. Wouldn't it be nice to have, to be part of the wizarding family and have family members like this? And Ron just says, oh my gosh, no, I've got five. For some reason he was looking gloomy. Why wouldn't you look gloomy? You're the runt. You could say I've got a lot to live up to. Bill was head boy and Charlie was captain of Quidditch. Now Percy's a prefect. Fred and George mess around a lot, but they still get really good marks and everyone thinks they're funny. Everyone expects me to do well as the others. But if I do, it's no big deal because they did it first. Bitterness is certainly understandable. It's not a good position to be in. So what are your choices? When confronted with a superior brother figure or sister figure, we have options. We can accept our limitations. That's what most of us do, because most of us, even if we, it's not directly a sibling rivalry, there's rivalry all around us. I've met people all my life that are much better at many, many different things than I am. But what do you do with it? You accept your limitations. You strive in other domains. You strive to live up to the ideals. Wow, that guy's great. I'm not going to be that guy. I play video games and there's, <laughs> I'm not a very good video gamer, but I don't resent the other people's talents uh, uh, um, when I see them do amazing things in video games. So we strive to live up to the ideal and the brother figure becomes an admire model for proper attitude and action. Yes. Or you can go the Loki way, the Joker way, and you can try to destroy the ideal either symbolically or quite literally. Unfortunately, the world is full of this literal destruction of the ideal. So by merely existing, the ideal, Ron, Harry, Percy, Fred, and George, merely their existence is a constant rebuke and an accusation, a threat to you, a reminder of your inadequacies, an evoker of shame and self-pity and self-hate. Those are dangerous, dangerous feelings. And so we can literally just choose to destroy the ideal like the Joker does and Loki does, or, or we can sullenly reject it and kill its memory. Remove yourself from your friends. Remove yourself from your family environment and kill the reputation of people, reputation destruction, or, or, or simply kill off your memory of them and, and, and destroy all of that potential uh, uh, goodness and happiness and love. Not so, not so Ron Weasley. Uh, okay, so that's vis-a-vis -vis his brothers. Here's the rivalry he's got going on with his brothers. And here's the Cain and Abel rivalry that is introduced here uh, uh, with, with Harry. So Ron's future rivalry with Harry is only hinted at, very, very, just only hinted at. Ron is amazed but grateful for the money Harry has to buy food. Now, I can't remember which uh, movie it is. I'm thinking about the movie right now because I can't remember if this is in the book or not. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm in this process of rereading them. Uh, but if you remember when... Uh, they're on the train again and at, and at the beginning of one of the mo movies, I'm going to think of the movie, uh, and Harry says, do you want something from the trolley, Ron? And Ron sullenly says, no, I've got something. So in the beginning, Ron is all excited. Wow, you've got lots of money. Great. Yeah, thanks for buying me these chocolate frogs and everything like this. And it's all fun and kitty stuff. Later on, as he's growing up, the resentment is starting to sink in. He says, no, I don't want your gifts, Harry. 
He's resentful of the gifts. I, 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 I got to get to the book and read that again. So anyway, so here's, here's you know, anything off the trolley, dears, comes the trolley lady and Ron, who hadn't had any breakfast. Ron, uh, sorry, Harry, leapt to his feet, but Ron's ears went pink and he muttered that he'd brought sandwiches. So again, that's cute when it happens once, twice, three times. The fourth time it happens where you have to show your friend that this is all I got and could you please give me more? The third, fourth, fifth time that happens, that's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. And you know that from your own experience. So the rivalry at this point uh, in time is mitigated for now by Ron's superior knowledge of the wizarding world and Harry's insecurities due to his ignorance. He's in a dominant position at the moment because Harry doesn't know anything about the wizarding world. So that kind of resentment is neutralized and they become more or less equals. Harry's got all this to bring to the table, but Ron has his understanding of the wizarding world to bring to the table besides his crappy sandwich. And so Harry is looking at a card, one of the, the frog cards, and says, so this is Dumbledore. And Ron says in amazement, don't tell me you've never heard of Dumbledore. Now look at this. Soon, Harry and Dumbledore are going to be best friends. They're going to be besties. And Ron is completely left out of the picture. Does Dumbledore even know who Ron is? Do you see what I'm saying? So that's how that resentment can grow over time. And then, Harry, and then as Harry, Harry skyrockets in everybody's mind, he's already skyrocketing, and he becomes you know, tight with Dumbledore and Ron just, again, disappears, 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 disappears. What do you do with that? You become the Weasleyan hero. Okay, so now let's talk about the Grangerian hero. The world needs Hermione Grangers for sure, intelligent and conscientious and hardworking. So with her intelligence and conscientiousness, Hermione becomes an essential helper in the hero's adventure ahead. Of course, of course, of course. In chapter one, however, she's presented more as a Malfoy figure. Very, very much. What's the difference between her and Malfoy? I, I don't know. She's, she's horrible. Everybody hates her. She's arrogant. She's prideful. She's disdainful of others. Like Ron, though, this is the key. Like Ron, though, she has a dynamic character arc and she changes. She changes when she's confronted with hard truths. Her emotional, social, and physical vulnerability make her realize that, wait a minute, I can't do everything on my own. I need the, the help of others. And she learns humility, gratitude, and ultimately love for humanity. So interesting characters developed in their own particular way. She's an ungracious know-it-all to begin with. And of course, this is how we all react to someone like her. Uh, so here she is. She, she comes in. This is this particular scene here. And Ron, of course, the goofball, is trying to do a spell that doesn't work because his older brothers are picking on the runt because they gave him the, they lied about this spell. So she comes in and she says, are you sure that's a real spell, said the girl? Well, it's not very good, is it? I've tried a few simple spells for practice and they've all worked for me. Do you hear that? Don't you just want to walk away from that? Uh, whatever house I'm in, I hope she's not in it, says Ron. Okay, so she's got some emotional learning to do, some social socializing to do. Uh, in contrast, very, very interestingly, Harry's instincts are to try to lessen Ron's humiliation about his dud spell rather than increase it. Now, this is one of these little throwaway lines that Rowling buries under the conversation between Ron and, 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 uh, and Harry. Uh, Ro Harry just says, you know, I think the ends of Scabber's whiskers are a bit lighter, he said, trying to take Ryan, uh, Ron's mind off the houses. So Ron, Ron starts getting worried about what house he's going to be in, and Harry tries to take his mind off, and he says, well, look, at your, your mouse's, the, the, the feathers are, it, the spell did work a little bit. So he's got an instinct here to make him feel better. Her instincts are not that at all. Her instincts are to show that she's great at everything. Those are her initial instincts. But as I said, due to her, she, she is humanized by life itself and she learns how to be a, a much more generous minded person. Okay, uh, theme restatement, avoidance coping starts to get really, really nasty now. What you need most shall be found where you least want to look. So says Carl Jung and he says right. Our tendency to avoid things we don't want to believe exist was first introduced in, in book one, page one, sentence one of the entire seven book series. It's, it's probably the most important theme. Uh, um, if you avoid something, you, you're just going to you're just going to make the problem worse. So avoidance coping in this chapter, in chapter six, avoidance coping is given its first direct challenge by Harry, who questions the wisdom of bad banning things, banning words, banning thoughts that make us uncomfortable. He knows that he, instinctively he feels that, well, I should, why am I so afraid of this? We have nothing to fear but fear ourselves is, 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 the, is what's 
is the feeling that's rumbling around in Harry when he's when he and Ron start talking with the Gringotts break in and he starts to feel this uncomfortableness with he starts to catch the, the he starts to catch the fear of actually saying the word Voldemort and this is where it starts so Harry turned this news of the Gringotts break in over in his mind he was starting to get a prickle of fear every time you know who was mentioned that never happened before he used to say well, Voldemort no problem but because he's he's catching it from everybody else he's starting to feel that he supposed this was all part of entering the magical world but he's smarter than that and he senses the truth of this we have nothing to fear but fear ourselves what you need most shall be found when you least want to look um, but it had been a lot more comfortable saying Voldemort without worrying it wasn't a problem before so why is it a problem now but anyway he's just young and he's just starting and so he just he just dismisses it later on of course when Umbridge comes back and you know he can't dismiss it and he, he actually stands up in front of the class and says no Voldemort is real and this is that first hint again the tapestry the mo tapestry of motifs is being woven and and rolling rolling inserts it here for the first time so fear is contagious and Harry is not immune to that as we see in uh, in later books this fear works in Voldemort's uh, to Voldemort's advantage preventing honest free inquiry into the political and social dangers that he possesses if nobody's allowed to talk about me if nobody's allowed to even think about me if nobody's allowed to say anything bad about my ideas or any ideas do you see I'm free to work my magic my seductive magic throughout the population and all of a sudden you wake up like Percy Weasley and boom you're a servant of the tyrant Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous stuff. Avoidance was funny when it was Uncle Vernon. Vernon. She introduced it, of course, with, with, with Vernon. It was funny. We laughed at Vernon for ignoring dangers. But when it's fudge and umbrage, it's not so, it's not so funny. So Voldemort is actually an allegory of these guys. If you don't know these, who these guys are, look them up. Read your history. Political right, political left. There are monsters everywhere. Look up horseshoe theory as well. If you go too far in either direction, you end up with tyranny. And this is what happens by gradual degrees. Voldemort is an allegory of these guys, very, very much so. All achieve power uh, on the backs of apologists and deniers. We sleepwalk into disaster is what we do. As I said before, when we talked about Percy, the problem with Percy, power corrupts little by little. We give up our freedoms and all of a sudden we find ourselves in an absolute nightmare, a hellhole. Okay, kind of related to that, I suppose, is uh, classism, classism, snobbery, and bigotry. We were already introduced to this theme, but it intensifies here and it becomes really, really dark and sinister with some serious foreshadowing. So chapter six intensifies the sinister tone of Malfoy's snobbery. The potential for microcosmic bullying is obvious in the menace presented by Crabbe and Goyle. So of course, there's the, my, the, the child reading this can just recognize, oh my gosh, this guy in the class that I'm really, really afraid of. Fair enough. But again, uh, uh, it, the, the, that microcosm danger uh, is can be projected onto the macrocosmic danger and we get hints of it direct hints of it here actually so at the macrocosmic level Voldemort's Voldemort's future tyranny is foreshadowed by both Ron and Malfoy so here's Malfoy here he says I'll be careful if I were you Potter he says on the train in the movie they're in the they're in Hogwarts when they're saying this on the steps uh, in the train he says I'd be careful if I were you Potter he said slowly unless you're a bit politer you'll go the same way as your parents Ooh, that's nasty that's real nasty that's a direct uh, 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 foreshadowing of the return of Voldemort, do you see? And, 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 a, and a statement of, of the danger that Voldemort uh, poses and has posed in the past. So they didn't, uh, they, they didn't know what was good for them either. You hang around with riffraff like the Weasleys and that Hagrid and it'll rub off on you. So there we go. Uh, and Ron re, uh, restates this as well. He says, I've heard of uh, Malfoy's family, uh, said Ron darkly. They were some of the first to come back to our side after you know who disappeared. Said he'd been bewitched. So this is the Percy Granger, uh, Percy, uh, Percy Granger. This is the Percy Weasley theme as well. They, the people who came back after Voldemort was defeated, they said that they were bewitched. Well, was Percy bewitched? Was he seduced by that? power DC and belief in the ministry um, so that's that's how nasty it can happen how slowly and stealthily it can happen but my dad doesn't believe that he was bewitched like literally bewitched by a witch uh, my dad says Malfoy's father didn't need an excuse to go over the dark side so yeah in all of these situations look back at the at history World War one World War two any of the horrors that have been committed throughout history and you'll find both of those people some people that just gleefully entered the fray they just want destruction they enjoy killing people they enjoy blowing things up those people exist and those are the Malfoys 
uh, kind of the Malfoy father. Malfoy is a bit ambiguous uh, and and very interesting character later on. Uh, and some people, yeah, some people like Percy are seduced by it all and the 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 hoopla of it all and that they get caught up in the whirlwind of it all. Like Harry starts to get caught up in it here. Do you see? We we can get caught up in this. Um, we, we can start to, 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 to feel the contagion, the social contagion is a real, real thing. And some people are not innocently sucked in by the social contagion, but they were naively sucked in by the social contagion. And some of them just said, yeah, they started the social contagion. Yeah, let's go kill some people. It's going to be fun, fun, fun. Yeah, so that's the, the older Malfoys. Younger Malfoy in the later books, though, he, he starts to come back. Okay, uh, theme restatement to the death of childhood, the threshold. Chiron and Fluffy were introduced in chapter five, so you can go back and watch that video for the first crossing. They've crossed water twice, and this is this is the more important one because they're entering uh, uh, their their old self is really dying, and they're entering Hogwarts where their new self is being is going to be born. So the crossing of water is an ancient ancient metaphor for death, the transformation from one state of being to another. In Harry Potter one, Hagrid is that ferryman. He is the Chiron figure, the ferryman, and the escort of souls into this new other world. So the students childhood selves have died and they must be reborn on the opposite shore and learn the new requirements of the new circumstances uh it's 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 very symbolic human beings need symbols if you don't have symbols in your social rituals in your religious rituals if you don't have it there you're going to find it somewhere else uh, you're going to find it in, in your dreams. Your dreams will tell you things. Or you find it in the Harry Potter movies and books. You find it in the Jedi stories. You find it in Lord of the Rings. We need these initiatory symbols to help us make the transformation from childhood to adulthood. And look around you. Look at the 27-year-old ch children, the 37-year-old children who haven't grown up yet. It's incredibly, incredibly sad. So we need these symbolic uh, initiatory rituals to help us grow up. And J.K. Rowling nails it. Uh, there's a tone, the reverential tone here suggests the magnitude, the significance of this crossing. Grow up. It's, it's, it's momentous. It's world shaking. And it's a heroic act to, to become a useful adult in the world, contribute, your, contribute to society, learn what society has to offer, and then contribute to it. It's wonderful. And without that, you've get, you, get, you get a wasteland, an absolute wasteland. So the world of adult knowledge is vast and rightly intimidating to these young students. Of course, they have a lot to learn. Now, her description of the, their first encounter with the castle is brilliant, and it's described in religious terms. And again, I'm not taking this story from a, a Christian point of view at all. It's a, the Hogwarts is depicted as a church, it's depicted as a temple, it's a cathedral, it's, it's, it's the repository, the great repository of transcendent wisdom of your culture, whatever the culture that is. So here they are, they're coming out, they just got off of the Hogwarts Express with one threshold and they're entering another threshold and they first get a glimpse of, the, uh, of, of Hogwarts on the edge of the Black Lake. Uh, so the narrow path had opened suddenly onto the edge of a great black lake. Death, 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 death. The river sticks in the Greek tradition. And the fleet of little boats moved off all at once, gliding across the lake, which was smooth as glass. Everyone was silent. You enter a church, you're silent. You're in the presence of something greater than you. You enter a temple, you're in the presence of something greater than you, so you shut up. You enter a library, a repository of your entire culture, a history that you humbly attempt to come to some kind of understanding with and so you are silent staring up at the great castle overhead uh, it's overhead it looms over them it is bigger than them it is bigger than you or i and we are privileged to try to take a little piece of that make it our own and contribute back so it towered over them as they sailed nearer and nearer to the cliff on which it stood and what do you do when you encounter something of magnificence of transcendence transcendent magnificence you bow your head in reverence Heads down, yelled Hagrid as the first boats approached the cliff. They all bent their heads in, in some kind of humility. She didn't have to put that in there. This is how we do literature. You ask yourself, why A, why not B? Why are those two things in there? Because either instinctively, J.K. Rowling knew that there was something important that would make the kids bow their heads, or she consciously thought of this. And I think an artist is a combination of both. An artist who is really in touch with their material, the archetypes of their material, these things get wove. These things naturally emerge from their imagination, and they end up on the paper. Sometimes uh, it works in the opposite direction. A, a, an artist can actually say, "Yeah, I want this to be a reverential moment, and so I'm going to put symbols of reverence in here." Come back for next chapter. There's a lot more reverence. The image of the candles and things like that, for example. So I, I think it was probably both conscious and unconscious on Rowling's part. 
So they bow their heads, going through the ivory, of ivy, uh, curtain of ivory, of ivy, uh, which hid a wide open in the cliff face. Hagrid raised a gig gigantic fist and knocked three times on the oak door. So again, that magic number three, uh, 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 um, an entrance into the into the into the transcendent. And uh, if I haven't talked about this before, the, the three is magic because it, it is it, it encompasses the, mag the number three encompasses our the entirety of our lives. We are born, we mature, become adults, and then we die. Youth, middle aged, old age, morning, noon, night. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything is stories, beginning, middle, end. Everything is centered around the magic number three. So if you evoke the number three, you're evoking all of all of existence, all of eternity, that kind of thing. Uh, the number four is also symbolic too, and three plus four equals seven. So for some reason in the West anyway, we've got this kind of magic number seven. And the number four represents the four points of the compass. So if you're standing in existence in an open field, you see all of the, the the horizontal plane and all of the vertical plane is a three as well the sky the earth the underworld there's the number three again so those two things together equal number seven so there's there's some symbols we need these symbols these are symbols that we've that have we used to believe in the magic of these numbers the literal magic we used to believe in it and they were symbols that helped guide us through our existence yes i have a beginning i have a middle I have an end i feel secure that that in that knowledge and understanding uh, a culture that gives up its symbols will find it somewhere else, uh, sometimes in nasty places through ideologies uh, or in, in, in your dreams. Or we come to, we, we oh my goodness, we pour, we pour our time and money into Lord of the Rings, Jedi stories, Harry Potter. We consume this stuff like we're starved for it. And we are. These are the symbols that we need to live. And this is a beautiful uh, symbolic uh, a depiction of the death of childhood, the threshold into uh, the first inklings of adulthood. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Okay, that was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 6, The Journey from Platform 9 and 3 quarters. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.